So this evening, we're going to discuss the MCAR movement. And where's Marcella? So, right yes. so I, I, this is just for you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, the MCAR movement is 67 years old this year. And it's characterized as a socially engaged Buddhism. And that may be the case, as I'll discuss later. But it's also a form of Buddhist modernism. And I think that that's one of the things to keep in mind. And, but it's Buddhist modernism from a contemporary Asian perspective. Now, Buddhist modernism, for those that are not aware of that, is a, is a, type, of moder- a type of Buddhist uh, perspective that started to take place in Asia in the early 1800s. Sorry about that. You know, we, we, we kid about this, but it's true. We used to be able to get by with one person who was giving the, the discussion. Now we need a producer, a director, as well as the person who's actually doing the, the, the project. Okay, so I started saying before that the Amateur Movement is 67 years old this year. Uh, well, let me go to where that is before I do that. So for those of you on Zoom, this is what you missed. Big deal, I know. (laughs) But you missed a beautiful picture. (laughs) And I started talking about the Amadikar movement. Um, So, and I was talking about Buddhist modernism. And Buddhist modernism started in the 19th century, actually the late 18th century into the modern century is reaction to colonialism. And so when you uh, hear IMS, Inside Meditation Society, for instance, and they had gone to Sri Lanka and to uh, Thailand primarily, when they got it, that was their, what they received was a result of that Buddhist modernism in Asia. The Sri Lankans had not been meditating for literally hundreds of years. And Buddhism in Sri Lanka, as an example, some of the monks there wanted to assert their notion of their religion because they were being inundated with um, colonial religions, Christianity missionary, Christian missionaries and people like that. And so th- that became a form of cultural um, response to the colonial oppression that they were experiencing. And then you come to the forward and you find the beats starting in the, you know, the 1950s, primarily in the 60s into the 70s. And you see um, a form of Buddhist modernism, which really takes on different elements, it takes on elements of people with a different worldview, beginning to assert a notion of this is really what Buddhism is projecting onto Buddhism, what it may or may not be, but it's what they wanted it to be. Um, put it you know, in, a, in a, just a few words, there's a whole issue about that. Um, however, we have another form of Buddhist modernism that began in other places like India, and the Amitkar movement is an example of that Buddhist modernism insofar as it was addressing a current socio-political issue in a way that they thought Buddhism would be consistent. And so they're applying a, they, they, and you'll find out about what that means uh, when we get to it. Um, so I find this is that the, from an Asian perspective, the Amitkar movement specifically was a valiant attempt to dismantle the systemic racism called the caste system that existed in India from the time of Shakyamuni Buddha um, until the, the period of, of partition in India when, the, when Pakistan separated from, from India and when there was a um, um, new constitution and the constitution specifically uh, forbade the caste system. Well, it's one thing to forbade something. It's another thing to actually carry it out when it's systemic. And so the caste system today is still um, alive and, and functioning in a very real way in India. Um, So it's an interesting example in this case, Amdikar movement of what they would identify, Amdikar people would identify as 
um, socially engaged Buddhism. And I also want to use the evening as an opportunity to examine the caste system, both historically in relation to Shasana, which was what Buddhism was called in Asia before it came to uh, outside of Asia. Um, at, so we want to look at that at the time of Shakyamuni up to today and how systemic racism is inherent within the caste system. And Isabel Wilkerson, who you may have read her book on caste, is actually a reflection of what she considers uh, racism in America as a caste system. And it's really interesting because you we can't move, you can, well, I, I won't go into that. That's, that's a whole other discussion. Um, and so we often use a convenient gloss of Buddhism as being opposed to the caste system that existed in India at the time of Shakyamuni Buddha. And then um, this is an opportunity to sort of look at that idea in a broader perspective. So let's start with the background. <clears throat> and this little diagram here is how we can just keep your mind on this diagram a little bit as we go through some of the points here. So the first is that the caste system is an artificial construction, obviously. It's fixed and embedded ranking of human values that set the presumed supremacy of one group against the presumed inferiority of other groups. And that's the definition that Isabel Wilkerson um, uses in, in her book on caste. Now, there's no universally accepted definition of caste, but we see features that are consistent what, what, to what we refer to as caste. And many societies have had caste systems in Asia, obviously, in Africa, in Europe, and the Americas. In the Americas, it was imposed by the Europeans toward enslaved peoples, indigenous Americans, and Africans. In India, the term caste is not originally an Indian word, rather a Persian word, though is now widely used both in English and in the Indian language. And it's derived from the Portuguese casta, meaning race, lineage, breed, and there's no exact translation in the Indian languages. But varna and jati are the two most approximate terms that are used in the Indian language. The origins of the caste system in India and Nepal are not fully known, but caste seems to have originated more than 3,000 years ago. And the system was systematized in the Rig Veda. In the Hindu system, it's based upon both on birth, karma, and perceived virtue in a previous lifetime. Although the early Vedic sources named four primary castes, were in fact thousands of castes, subcastes, and communities within Indian society. At the time of Buddhism, the caste system was not as well defined as about a century later. Originally, caste depended upon a person's work within a short period of time, and it soon became hereditary. Each person was born into an in unalterable social status. Caste dictates almost every aspect of Hindu religious and social life, with each group occupying a specific place in this complex hierarchy. Rural communities have long been arranged on the basis of caste. The upper and lower castes are almost always lived in segregated colonies. The water wells were not shared. Brahmins would not accept food or drink from shudras, and one could marry only within one's caste. And a final note, we're discussing India, but in Asia, there are caste systems in Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, Sri Lanka, and to a lesser extent in Bhutan and Burma today. And there are variations on all of these systems. So it's not unique to India, the Indian state as we see it today. We have the idea of the castes and the Dalits. Come on. Why is this not? There we go. So the, in the caste system, um, more recent research indicates that until the 18th century, so the caste has been in place for 3,000 years. In the 18th century, and I was talking about the effect of colonialism on various places in Asia and Africa. Um, 
The formal distinctions of caste were of limited importance to mostly Indians. I mean, it was certainly there. The social identities were much more flexible and people could move from one caste to another. This is really interesting. And the hard boundaries of the castes were actually set by the British colonial rulers who made caste India's defining social feature. So the caste that we see today, while there had been a caste for thousands of years, the caste that we see today is really a reflection of the British imposition as a way of ruling people. And they used the census to simplify the system, primarily to create a single society with common law that could easily go, that they could easily govern. And the four primary castes are, I wonder if this is going to work. Here we go. The Brahmins, who are the priests, and, and to a very large extent, they are also uh, scholars and elites of various forms. Ashtriya, who are the warriors and nobility. Vaishya, farmers, traders, artisans, and Shudra, tenants, farmers, and servants. And you see the picture there of the Brahmins, the Kashtriya, Vaishya, Shudra, and you notice that the more people are, it, it really is a pyramid. So there's many fewer Brahmins, many more uh, Sudra, commoners, et cetera, which you might expect. Now, the interesting thing is the Dalits are really not part of the caste system. <laughs> We think of the Dalits, the untouchables, as being part of the caste system, but according to the Hindu um, categorization, they're people who are born outside of and below the caste system. Hence, they're untouchable. They're, they're called untouchable or Dalits, and Dalit means the crushed ones. And they were and are not permitted to set foot in a Hindu temple. As a matter of fact, several years ago, there was a case of a couple of dozen people who had be, beaten a Dalit who was sitting on the steps of the temple. And the Indian court said, refused, to, refused to convict them of murder, even though there are plenty of witnesses that these couple of dozen people killed this Dalit who was sitting on the temple steps. So it demonstrates the degree to which there's a complicity within the government of the caste system today. Um, so the they're not permitted in a temple and are restricted to the most menial jobs that are considered impure, like uh, people who are um, sweet streepers, latrine cleaners, uh, people who would slaughter animals, things that are considered impure by the Hindu system. Is the system legal? Work. <laughs> Oh, <clears throat> let me go back. Like it's getting every other click. Okay. So the question is, is the system legal? India's independent constitution banned discrimination on the basis of caste hierarchy. However, it should be noted that the Indian constitution in 1949, post-partition, asserts equality and caste is only an identity mark and it cannot be permitted to be a basis or any discrimination against any person in society. The reality is much more the promise of equality. And in some ways, you can think of, of that Indian system as rather like the American system that we had of separate and equal. So it became a way of identifying, saying, well, we can have a society which is separate and, and uh, equal. We know from our own experience that doesn't work very well. So in my, it's my position that black, brown, and many Asian peoples are in caste positions in addition to class. So in India and those other countries, you have caste and you have class. Um, and I don't think that's so different than what we see in the United States today. So going forward, we can look at Ambedkar, who actually was the father of the Indian constitution. This is what's really fascinating about this. Who was the person that this movement is named after, who started this movement? Um, Bimram Ramji Ambedkar, also known popularly as Baba Sahib, was <coughs> born in the Mahar Dalit untouchable caste.
through patrons, Emma Carr earned a PhD from Columbia University, a doctor of science degree from the University of London, was a barrister in London. When he returned to India, he became a professor, barrister, writer, a leader in the partitioning of India. Nonetheless, people were afraid to touch notebooks, the papers he used. He was not allowed to drink from public water fountains, refused service, and subjected to many other indignities due to his caste. While English speakers are typically familiar with the current portrayal of Mahatma Gandhi as a, a saintly liberator of India, only a small percentage of Indians know that Ambedkar wrote the draft for the Indian constitutions. It's many times attributed to Gandhi, but it was actually Ambedkar who wrote the draft. In despair, because of the perpetuation of untouchability in Hindu doctrine, he and his wife renounced Hinduism and became Buddhist. As a side note, from the perspective of untouchables, this is interesting. Gandhi, who was of a high caste, the Brahmin, maintained the unequal caste system through his support of Hinduism. And to the untouchables today, Gandhi remains one of the most hated people of his time. Interestingly, I always found that to be an interesting side note. <clears throat> Shasana in India. So what was the history? Everyone knows the Shasana, the approximation of Buddhism in English, commenced with the awakening of Shakyamuni Buddha in the fifth century. And the zenith of Buddhayana was the Ashokan Empire in the third century BCE. It began to decline from an increased influence of Brahmanism's role in socio political affairs. While extremely influential, especially among the nobility, Shasana was always a minority tradition in India. The 11th century Persian trader Al Biruni writes that there was cordial hatred between Brahmins and Shramana Buddhists through the monastic complexes thrived to the patronages of the kingdoms. By the end of the 12th century, at the time of the Muslim invasion, Buddhism had mostly disappeared. The destruction of monasteries and stupas in the Northwest and Western India was the coup de grace. And in contemporary India, with the exception of some small pockets of Buddhism, primarily found near famous pilgrimage sites such as Bodh Gaya and Sarnath, the Buddhist groups are primarily a relatively small number. They are both Theravada and Mahayana Buddhist, and that includes the exiled Tibetans in the north. Um, there, they number about 150,000 people of the Tibetan Buddhist tour in India, and of course, they live in an exiled community. And there are about 8 million adherents of people in the Ambedkar movement. Now, just to put this into to some sort of context, how many Buddhists live in the United States? What do you think? What, what number? Of, there's 8 million Ambedkar Buddhists in India. Two to 3 million is the best guesstimate. It depends upon how you define who's a Buddhist. But it's between 2 to 3 million is estimated in the United States. So that means that there's about four times more Ambedkar <laughs> Buddhists in India compared to the number of Buddhists in the United States. <clears throat> if we look at the origins of the Ambedkar movement, <clears throat> having written a draft of the Indian constitution and been well renowned as a scholar, he and his family still suffered brutal discrimination with the background as a valid. And Amdikar stood up for the Dalits and demanded election rights, recognizing the nature of systemic racism. He studied Marxism. <clears throat> he studied Marxism and at first cooperated with the communists in his country, even though they were <clears throat> in the Indian, in the Indian Congress, they supported the caste discrimination. Excuse me. Later, he rejected communists due to what he saw as their violent and terrorist <laughs> methods. He rejected Hinduism because, as Hun writes, the Vedic society was based on the principle of greater inequality, specifically by following the scheme of Manu. Hinduism does not recognize equality of men because it follows a ranking system in an order, not gradation. Likewise, he 
rejected Christianity for promoting a hierarchy in both church and society while promising equality only after death. I, I can see where you might have a problem with that. <laughs> it was also put off by Islam's treatment of women. And he was a strong uh, supporter of, of feminism. Uh, and this was, of course, in the 1950s. While the Sikh religion had elements that were desirable, he recognized he would be a second-class Sikh. Eventually, he found Buddhism a value of the relationship among people. Uh, though he did mix this morality with Marxist principles, he wrote in Buddha and his Dhamma that he felt that the Dalits were originally Buddhists. This goes back to his, why did he choose Buddhism? He felt the Dalits were originally Buddhist. And there is, of course, no evidence for the claim. He and his wife took refuge in the five lay vows after delivering papers to the World Council of Buddhism. Conversion to Buddhism. On October 14th, 1956, two months after his death, Bimram Raj Amdakar brought several hundreds, I should have said two months before his death, not after his death, would have been difficult to do. Uh, brought several hundreds of thousands of followers, mostly belonging to his own untouchable Mahar caste into conversion to Buddhism. And in addition to the five lay precepts associated with refuge or conversion as Amitkar referred to it, he required an additional 17 promises from his followers but some were affirmations of Buddhist teachings. Now, you know, the five lay vows that take, people take during refuge are basically uh, not to kill, not to steal, not to give, not to, to, to lie or to give false uh, vows, um, not to conduct sexual misconduct and not to drink alcohol beyond uh, awareness. Those are the five lay vows that, that are standard. But he insisted upon 17 additional vows. Now, he followed the Eightfold Noble Path, and he said, I firmly believe, and this is a quote of his, I firmly believe that Buddha Dhamma is the best religion. Several positive examples. 21, I believe that today I am taking new birth. Number 22, I solemnly take the oath that from today onward, I will act according to the Buddha Dhamma. Clearly, Amitakar was less than consistent in his views on Buddhism and demonstrated a varying interpretation from the most legitimate schools of Buddhism. As such, he regarded the Four Noble Truths as an invention of wrong-headed monks and refused to teach that. And the Four, the, the, the four Noble Truths is the basic foundation of Buddhism from which all else springs. Um, we may accept the 22 promises by Amitakar's followers are an emphatic expression of their entry into Buddhism. It's a different story with those promises which articulate Amitakar's own social and anti-Hindu agenda. Number 11 says, says it all. Quote, I embrace today's Buddha Dharma, discarding the Hindu religion, which is detrimental to the emancipation of human beings and which believes in inequality and regards human beings other than Brahmins as low-born. That pretty much covers. Yeah. covers. That's, a, that's about what <laughs> <to ask. That's laughs> like, After the initial conversion ceremony, move down a little bit. Um, after the initial conversion ceremony, tens of thousands of dollars have adopted Buddhism each year. And by converting to Buddhism, Amitakarites, as they refer to themselves, consider themselves exempt from Hindu discrimination. Though here's the key. They, their view is that if I take the Buddhist vows, I'm no longer um, a Hindu. Therefore, why should I need to adhere to Hindu values, i.e. the caste system? Well, that's great. But that doesn't mean that the Hindus have to agree with you. <laughs> and remember, from a Hindu perspective, Buddhism is a poor second cousin to Hinduism. They view Buddhism as actually sort of a sub-branch of, of Hinduism. Um, and so, paradoxically, while the Hindu constitution has provisions for the social and economic uplift of Dalits to support their upward social mobility, 
these concessions are limited to Hindus, not to Dalits, who've been converted to Buddhism or to Islam. Characteristics today. Can I do it? There we go. All right. I, I thought this was a great picture. Emily <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> portrayed Buddha as a rationalist social reformer concerned with the well-being of persons in this world, <coughs> liberation from oppressive social conditions. Thus, he recognized that many of Buddhism's traditional teachings would not only offend Allah, but also, more importantly, would not be conducive to their social and spiritual emancipation, which is why he didn't include things like the Four Noble Truths. Ambedkarites are critical of traditional Buddhism, and which they consider superstition, superstitious, and is led by misguided interpolations and escapist monks. I certainly am an escapist monk. I escape to the diamond way whenever I can. Right? The one over in Troy? The, especially the one in Troy, yes. Yeah. Um, I should note here that there are cases in which Emmetkar leaders today are anti clerical and demean traditional Buddhist teachers and teachings. And Shumon and I know this specifically from a Tendai teacher who is an Indian who lives in India and has had incredible amount of difficulty with the Emmetkar movement. Um, not permitting him to practice Tendai Buddhism because they view him as um, superstitious, et cetera, et cetera. Um, while critics often point out that Amitkar failed to lead the majority of Dalits in India to reject Hinduism and embrace Buddhism, it must still be acknowledged that he sparked a revival of Buddhism in India that's attracted literally millions of followers who claim to find the exposition of Buddhist teachers the remedy for their social and spiritual ills. And we're coming to a conclusion. And one of the reasons I wanted to give this talk is because I just love Indian prints. Uh, there are valid criticisms of Ambedkar movement by traditional Theravada and Mahayana Buddhists in India and out. And much of the criticism of Ambedkar brought on himself by accepting those Buddhist doctrines which he liked and rejecting those he did not like. That's where I get the idea that it's Buddhist modernism. That's a, a characteristic of Buddhist modernism. Um, as such, this is an example of Asian Buddhist modernism taken to an extreme. And it's sometimes difficult for us to view Buddhist modernism in a Western context because we're so embedded within it. In this example, we can be outside of it looking in. What does Buddhist modernism look like in a different place? Amitkar's rejection of traditional Buddhism as, is as severe as his rejection of Hinduism, which is really interesting. Therefore, they reject what we think of as, as traditional Buddhism, whether it's pure land, Zen, Tendai, Tibetan, et cetera, et cetera. On a positive side, the social program has mitigated racism, systemic racism. It's not worked out as well as Amit Carr would have imagined, probably not. But does it inform us further about caste and racism in America? Maybe so, because we can look at the caste system in the Asian subcontinent and see, it, see a parallel development in what we think of as racism in America, because if you're black, you're black. It doesn't matter how much money you make, it doesn't matter how much education you make, it doesn't matter how, what your job is, et cetera. You're still considered inferior by many people. That, according to Wilkerson, as well as others, is really what we're talking about when we're talking about it. Okay? And so these are some of the sources that I used. Um, so let's stop this here and go to a, the questions and answers. I'm going to unmute everyone. Thank you. Okay. So what, okay, we'll start with Mushin. Mushin, go ahead. Yeah, so they, are they still, is Amdakar 
Buddhism still converting hundreds of thousands of people? They have ceremonies in um, India on Vesak in which they will fill a cricket stadium or a soccer stadium and convert a full stadium of people at one time. Yeah, I'd like to <clears throat> put my two cents in. I have a daughter-in-law in India, and I went to visit there a couple of times, <clears throat> and her grandmother lives in a very remote village with, you know, clay stove, etc. And they actually don't like Modi because he says, here, put in this gas stove and you're, you know, all your problems are solved. But my uh, equivalent of me, the Nietzsche's grandmother, or great grandmother, well, anyway, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, she brought up her four sons. They went to an academy down the street. They all became professionals. And then uh, Nietzsche's father, Adopted the whole thing, and the whole thing. You mean the whole thing? Mean, I'm well, well, yes, but yeah. they're they're not very like devoted. Mm -hmm. to, it's like almost like a past type of thing. Mm -hmm. But um, oh, it was so important. <laughs> no, but it, it's just so, I, to, to me, it's a wonderful thing, and that's why Nita she. Ditched and arranged marriage, came to America, you know, met my son in, in college. And um, the, 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 the motto that they got from Ken Begar was study hard, study hard, like education. So imagine if that didn't, hadn't happened. Right. You know, Nietzsche was born in that remote village and then moved to Brahma for the University. Yeah. And, and in fact, yes. Amritkar himself was was so well schooled. I mean, I don't know how many degrees he had yeah, altogether. Yeah. It wasn't just undergraduate, yeah. masters, and doctorate. He had like eight degrees. Yes. yes. You know, many yes. advanced degrees. So I mean, yeah. he was a genius without a doubt. Yeah. And and you know, it was his uncle that took him out of the town he was in. He was mm -hmm. untouchable. He was a was the education. And yeah. Oh, cut in. Okay. Uh, what other questions do we have? Somebody on the. Uh, uh, Jay, please go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering. Uh, so, in the slideshow you had, uh, and in the presentation you were talking about how he would be considered if if Ambedkar decided to become a Sikh, he would be considered second class Sikh. And I was just wondering if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah. Well, Sikhism is a kind of. Um, synchrony between Hinduism and Islam. And so he realized that there would be so many elements that were uh, based uh, within Sikhism that were based upon Hindu elements that he would be a second-class citizen, not necessarily untouchable as he was within the Hindu system, but he would never be fully a Sikh. The other aspect of that is that you have to remember is that Sikhs are not permitted to marry someone who was not a Sikh. And so if he had become Sikh, then what would have happened to his children? And would they be able to, uh, you know, the, would, would they accept? Sikhism does not really permit conversion, is really what it comes down to. And, and that's why they don't permit marriage outside of someone who was born a Sikh. And, and so the question had to do with just the logistics of being a Sikh to begin with. You can't convert, you can't marry outside of the tradition, et cetera. So he would have been a second class uh, citizen. They might have accepted him at some level, but not as a full Sikh. Okay. And you keep using the term um, conversion specific. Right, that's a term he used. He used, right? Yeah. And is there a distinction that he used around that in terms of why he used conversion as the word rather than? Yeah, because he felt that he felt in, in, the, in the same way that within the Abrahamic traditions, which are exclusivist, that is say, if you are Muslim, you would have to convert, if you're an observant Muslim, you would have to convert if you wanted to marry someone who was not, mm -hmm. if the other person was not, they would have to convert. So he used conversion in that, in that context 
Um, and and I, I think that one of the other interesting things is I, I never saw that he even thought about being a Jain. I, mm. I couldn't find anything about that. Why Buddhism, but not Jainism as an example? I, I, I have no idea. That's, that's just a, always a, a query in my mind. It's never addressed. Any other questions? In the house or on the Zoom? Sensei, did you, did, were you gonna say something? Yes. Uh, just a moment, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excuse me. Okay. I just, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, Manake, he's a disciple of uh, Horisawa Somon in, in Mount Hie. Uh, his father, he's now an abbot of the Zenjorin Temple in India uh, of Tendai. And uh, his um, father was uh, a secret, uh, secretary to Ambedokar. And they saw uh, uh, Ambedokar's maybe a uh, concept uh, carried by the uh, Manake who trained at Mount He over maybe 15 years uh, when he, he came to Mount He around uh, uh, maybe a very early uh, boy. I, and, I think he was about six or seven years old when he went to Mount He, wasn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he's a uh, Ambedoka is a very interesting person. Uh, he's uh, uh, his family root uh, is uh, Naga family, and uh, about uh, fifteen hundred years before Christ, when the uh, Aryans attacks India, the uh, Naga tribes against uh, Aryans. That was uh, th that is why the Naga family was rejected out of caste. Mm -hmm. And, but uh, so Ambedokao, uh, he's a very pioneering person among uh, Naga tribes. Uh, and uh, he declared, uh, you know, everyone is equal based upon the Buddha. And uh, so uh, I think uh, Ambedokao is, Ambedokao uh, was very uh, important person of the Buddhist, I think. That mm. is my comment. Thank you, Sensei. That's, a, that's an interesting, interesting perspective. I appreciate it. Are there any other questions that we have? So, uh, so as a result of uh, conversion, the Dalits get treated differently? No, and that's that's part of the problem. I know that. Yeah, that's that is I one mean, of the problems. Dalit tries to move into a, right. a, a neighborhood. Uh, we'll, we'll band together and like we'll burn them out. Yep. Is it horrible? Is it a matter that the the that the Amdekar community creates its own community for itself? It, you know, in terms of you know I, education I, institutions or things like that. I, I think there is that, and as as Marcello was saying before, because there are such a, a one of the things to keep in mind is that while education is free to everyone, it's not necessarily available to everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, and and furthermore, that the Amerikar movement is very reliant upon education, so they see education as a way of social mobility. Mm -hmm. But that and 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 I, you know we 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 paint the picture in one way, but different parts of India treat Dalits in different ways. It's not uniformly across India. And so that the, the people within the Amtakar movement do tend to gravitate with each other. They tend to stick with each other as a way to avoid the discrimination that they would experience in a larger society. Yeah. Any other questions or thoughts that we have? I don't know. I, I find it to be really interesting, um, the Amtakar as a person and in the Amtakar movement. I, I find it really fascinating that on one hand, it was so influential during the partition of India that he actually wrote the constitution. But on the other hand, he was still denied full rights and he was discriminated against. Uh, and and I, I guess that's, 
That's like if you're, you know, African American and you fought for this for the during the revolution, and you would still be left with um, potentially being a slave. You know, it's it's not unlike that situation, and that's and that's why Isabel Wilkerson talks about racism in America as being um, not unlike the caste system. Well, I'm going to call it here, and Koshin is going to take the folks out to the hondo. So everyone who's going out to the hondo. Today, we discussed M. Dakar, certainly a genius, a person who has made a difference not just to hundreds of thousands of people, but literally millions of people. There's no doubt about it. He thought by changing a categorization of the caste system, he could eliminate a systemic evil, the category of the Dalits. And while he has undoubtedly provided a sense of hope and promise for those people, Dalits in the Indian subcontinent are still considered Dalits by the people there. It's clear that it's difficult, extremely difficult, to make systemic changes. Today, three people from the Chatham Area Interfaith Council and specifically the anti-racism forum of that group met with Columbia County Sheriff Don Kraft and the under sheriff Jacqueline Salvatore. Three people were Gloria Jimson from the African Methodist Episcopal Church, Len Grossman from the Chatham Synagogue, and me. We were just three people of the much larger group that were there as representatives. And we were there to be part of, to give our support actually to the sheriff's plan to desert, diversify the sheriff's department, to provide anti-bias training, which we will be doing in the future, work toward greater equity in the department, both on regarding um, LBGTQ rights, um, gender issues, uh, a whole host of, of factors. And I won't go into all the programs we worked on, but I have several points that I want to make about our meeting with the sheriff and the undersheriff today. The first is that from my perspective, this was not an example of engaged Buddhism. However, I certainly did bring a Buddhist perspective to the discussion. Second, I could not have done this alone as a Buddhist. I think that Don Kraft, the sheriff, and Jackie would have been happy to meet with me, but I'm not sure that I would have had the same reception that we had by virtue of the fact that we were re representing a number of different congregations. And it was through the Interfaith Project that's been meeting twice a month for over two years, studying together, learning, trusting each other, and growing together that we can contribute to this powerful work. The third thing, and I think that this is important, is the sheriff, who had been a lifelong Republican, chose to run as a Democrat and was elected by the hard work of people to unseat unseat the incumbent sheriff last year. By the way, the incumbent sheriff, his name was Bartlett, had been a member of the Oath Keepers, the same organization that had uh, attacked the Capitol on January 6th. So there was a lot of reason to um, consider unseating that person. In other words, working locally, doing the nitty gritty, the knocking on doors, the phone calling, change the political landscape. And oh, by the way, the undersheriff is a dynamic black woman who the new sheriff brought in to the office and create a position specifically for her to be part of his agenda to change. All of the above, are examples of how anti-racism works. It's not what you think. It's not how you believe 
or at least how you think you believe, but it's what are you going to do about it? That's the important message here. It's also about not being cynical and saying, there's nothing that's going to change. I can't do anything about it. What can I do? It is going to get better and it is going to change. It is going to work. But we as individuals have to make that happen, not by being cynical, not by being lazy, not by just merely thinking, well, it's not my problem, which is unfortunately how too many people think. Again, this isn't engaged Buddhism. It's working with Buddhist teachings and with people from many faiths to make a constructive difference. And I think that that's really important. One of the essential aspects of Tendai, which we we try to present, is that there is no truth with a capital T. There are many ways of approaching this life and doing something which is useful. And this evening, we were talking about Amdekar, and we we're talking about um, what was happening uh, at in the 1950s when he created his movement and about Hindus. But you have to keep in mind that some of the strongest people that I work with are Hindus in the Albany Capital District. We have a very close relationship with Hindu people. So this was in no way an indictment of Hindu, although we might get into Hindu nationalism as it's pre- presently being practiced in India as being uh, an aberrant uh, notion of Hinduism. But so I don't want people to think that that this discussion was was anti-Hindu because um, they would have been with us today, um, except we had to re- restrict the number of people that were attending. What will this look like in five years, working with the Sheriff's Department, working with Don and Jackie? And by the way, it's not just working with the Sheriff's Department d- directly, but also working in the county jail. Many of us have been working with, we're grief counselors, and we work in the jail to assist those people who have been imprisoned, uh, working with them both in a spiritual sense, but also in a very pragmatic sense. What can we do to, to assist them in many cases because they're separated from their families and, and that sort of thing? So what we're doing is not restricted to just uh, racism. That's a big that's a big portion of it, but it and and LBGTQ rights, uh, women's rights, et cetera. But we're also working with with many many others. There's a the fastest growing population in Columbia County today is the Muslim population, and they're viewed as brown people. And as such, they also we note are subject to discrimination. Uh, perhaps not as as not equivalent to what we see with uh, African Americans, but it's nonetheless there. But what will this look like in five years? I'm not even going to speculate. But at least those of us who are working on this will feel a sense of humanness. These changes are incremental, but it are even though they're incremental, they're making solid changes to the future, working toward a more equitable, just society. That is the Buddhist way. And it's our way of liberating all sentient beings, the first of the bodhisattva vows, svaha. And let me... Go to the quote, evil asks little of the dominant caste other than to sit back and do nothing. I think that pretty much sums it up in many ways.